Life is a winding road. No telling where it goes. Hey guys, Amber here with a Meeple family, and today we're gonna to be looking at a great flip and write called Doodle Dungeon. I'm gonna be showing you how to play, and at the end of the video, I'll give you kind of our family's experience and review of this game. We have played this several times around the table, so I'm excited to teach you how the game works, and then also tell you some pros and cons at the end of the video so you can decide if it's a good fit for your gaming table. So let's get started with how to play Doodle Dungeon. All right, so here we have all of the components that come with within Doodle Dungeon. You're gonna have several of these dungeon sheets and they are double-sided, which I really appreciate. Instead of just a plain white on the back, you're actually able to use the back side as well. The game is gonna come with four pencils, an eraser, which you can see we have really put to the test. We've got four die, we have our four heroes. The pencil sharpener actually serves as the first player marker. You also get some stencils that help you draw the different icons that you're gonna be putting in your dungeon. We're also gonna have cards, which have a multi-purpose, which we will go into. In addition to the official dungeon sheet, each player is also going to get their own score sheet. And we'll get into how this works in a moment. But I wanted you to get an idea of everything that actually comes with the game. So let's talk about game setup. It's pretty simple. You can go ahead and set the dice and heroes aside for now. We'll need those in a later phase of the game. To get started, each player is going to need their own dungeon sheet, a score sheet, a pencil, a stencil, unless they would like to freehand their drawings, and we will need the first player marker as well. Depending on how many dungeon masters are playing the game, will dictate how many cards we remove from the deck. In a two player game, you'll remove 18 cards. In a three player game, you'll remove four cards, and in a four dungeon master game, you'll remove one card. Let's go ahead and set up a two player game and remove 18 cards. Make sure you don't look at these cards and go ahead and put them back in the box. We won't need them for our two player game. At this point, you'll need to decide which player is going to be the first player and make sure that they have the pencil sharpener. Doodle Dungeon is played in three phases. First, we're gonna build our dungeon. We're gonna draft cards and draw the icons on the cards onto our dungeon. During the next phase, we'll actually exchange dungeons with our opponent. And during this phase, we will take on the action as hero, and we will actually draw the hero's path through our opponent's dungeon. In the last and final phase, we will defend our dungeon. And of course, the person with the most points and best dungeon wins the game and is the dungeon master. So let's look at each of these phases so we can get a good understanding of how the game plays. During the first phase, which is the build a dungeon phase, it will consist of 14 identical rounds. Since we're playing a two player game, we will put out three dungeon cards. You're always going to put out one additional card based on player count. So in a three player game, you would put out four cards and in a four player game, five cards. Now beginning with the player who has the pencil sharpener and continuing clockwise, each player will choose one card and place it face up in front of them. At this point, we're really just looking at the icons on the bottom, but also keeping in mind the top portions of the cards will be valuable to us when we're defending our dungeon in the third phase. Once each player has drafted their dungeon card, you're always gonna have one card left over. So let's go ahead and start a discard pile. The cards that we draft throughout the game are going to depict different icons. Our stencil actually shows the five different icons that could come up on the card that we can add to our dungeon. So we have traps, dragon, orc, goblin, and a wall. There are two other icons, which we'll talk about in just a moment. But these are the five building elements within the game. Let's go over some of the basic rules that we have to follow when it comes to building our dungeon. So first of all, Walls can never block a hero from coming into the dungeon or leaving the dungeon. You need to draw a clear path for your hero to take so that they can exit the dungeon. You can't partition off parts of your dungeon. The hero needs to be able to explore the entire dungeon. So for instance, I've drafted this card as my first dungeon card. Keep in mind when adding walls to your dungeon, you just need to keep them in the same shape. You can rotate them or flip them, but they need to match the same shape. It's also helpful to keep in mind that during phase two, when we're actually drawing
drawing our path for the hero, heroes cannot move diagonally. They can only move orthogonally. Also, when you're adding walls to your dungeon, you don't have to keep them connected. You can put them anywhere as long as it's a legal place to put them and it doesn't block your hero from getting in or out of the dungeon or block off areas of the dungeon. Now let's talk about traps and monsters. You can force your hero to run into a trap or encounter a monster. For instance, I have a goblin and an orc. I can put a goblin or orc right in the beginning of my dungeon, forcing my hero to encounter that goblin or orc. When drawing monsters on our dungeon, monsters can only be placed diagonally. They cannot be placed next to each other, only diagonally. So I may decide to put a goblin here. Now, for drawing my orc, I cannot put it right next to the goblin, but I could do it a space away. Once I've drawn all the elements on my card, I can then place it face down. At a later phase in the game, we'll be using our 14 cards we've collected during the building phase as our personal action hand. Let's go ahead and flip up another three cards to start the next round. Each player has now drafted their card, and again, the final card will be discarded. I have a new element in this card called a treasure. Now treasures are not actually drawn onto our dungeon sheet. In fact, they're kept secret on our score sheet. The important thing to know with treasures is that they have to be guarded by a monster. This means that I want to place my treasure in a space that has a monster or a space that I'm reserving for later when I draft a monster. So currently I have monsters at A1 and A3. You can see there's numbers and letters that help us pinpoint each square so that we can easily identify where we've hidden treasure. For this example, let's say that I want to put my treasure in A3. I'll simply write A3 on my score sheet and keep it face down, hidden from everyone else I'm playing with. At the end of the game, only treasures where monsters are still at will be counted for points. If for some reason my monster flees during the battle, then I will lose the treasure that I placed here. You want to be sure to place treasures where your monsters will not flee or maybe will not even come into an encounter with your hero. Now I also need to draw my wall and my trap on my map. Once I've drawn the elements, I'm ready for the next round of card drafting. Let's take a look at the final icons we may see. These are called improvements. You can see they're just little squares with X's in them. This card allows me four improvements. Now improvements are gonna be up here at the top section of our dungeon sheet. We have several places that we can improve, so let's quickly look through each one. You can always improve your different monsters. Each of these monsters have a different different start strength. Our goblins are at zero, orcs start at two, and dragons start at four. Each of these also award different damage to heroes during the defend your dungeon phase. Goblins give one damage, orcs two, and dragons three. These also award different points at the end of the game if they're still standing. We can see that here, goblins give one point, orcs two, and dragons three. So for every dragon at the end of your game that has not fled will give you three points. I think it's important to know how the battles work at this phase of the game. During the battle, we'll get to roll two die and add the value together. We need to get at least 20, including the numbers of our two dice plus our monster's strength. So for example, if I roll a four and a six, which is 10, and combine that with my dragon strength of four, that would only be 14 strength. And in order to defeat a hero, we need to get at least 20 total strength or higher. Anything under 20, means that our monster flees. So this is important to keep in mind as you're deciding where to put your improvements and what monsters to add to your dungeon. The other option we have to improve are our cards in hand. During the final phase where we defend our dungeon, we are going to be able to have cards in our hand that we can use during battle or red cards like this that work against our opponents. This is an important element as well. These cards may be just what you need to keep your monster alive. The other place we can look at adding our improvements is our treasure. If you're choosing to really invest in treasure, you can make your treasure 
worth more at the end of the game. You may be able to make each treasure worth up to four points if you choose to put your improvements in this area. Lastly, we have traps. Traps are these icons here. We don't actually use dice to fight the hero when it comes to traps. Traps automatically give damage to the hero. Initially, traps are just worth one damage, but if you choose to use your improvements in this area, they could be worth up to three damage. Now we're ready for phase two, which is drawing the hero's path. I've already put an example out here of a completed dungeon and a completed path so you can see what that looks like. So during this phase, we exchange dungeons with our opponent and we take on the hero. You're able to look up here at the information to see what your dungeon master has built up. So I can see here that this dungeon master has very weak goblins and very weak dragons, but very strong orcs and traps, and they only have two treasure hidden. So during the draw a hero's path, you are gonna take on the role of hero. You are gonna be drawing a path in your opponent's dungeon that your hero is going to go on. There's only a couple rules when drawing this path. You must draw the path as a single continuous line from the entrance all the way to the exit. Your hero may only move vertically or horizontally, not diagonally. Your path can cross over itself and may run parallel to itself. However, the path may only cross through each space a maximum of two times. So we can see here, when I drew this hero's path, I wanted to go up to this goblin. So I was able to go up only crossing through this square twice. The rulebook also contains great imagery and explanations to help make sure you understand how you can take your hero on their path through the dungeon. After each player has drawn the hero path, we're ready for phase three, which is defend the dungeon. In defend the dungeon, each player is going to need a hero. Go ahead and place the hero at the entrance of the dungeon. You're also going to want to take your personal action deck. Remember, these are all the cards we drafted during that first phase of the game. You should have a total of 14. Go ahead and shuffle them and keep them face down. Defend the dungeon has four different phases. We will always move the hero, carry out an encounter when they run into a monster or a trap. We will then play hero actions and refill cards in hand. So let's break down what each of these steps are. For our first turn this phase, we're only going to be performing steps three and four. So let's get started by looking at the cards in hand were allowed. I have selected all the way up to four. So I am able to have four dungeon cards in my hand. Now you're gonna see two colors. I've got blue cards and red cards. The blue cards are going to help me defend my dungeon. The red cards are cards I can play on opponents to help their hero and hurt them as the dungeon master. On the first turn only, we're gonna start with step three, which is play hero actions. So I can go ahead and play both of these on my opponent. This curse means that in the next fight, the monster has negative three strength for my opponent and at the start of the next turn the hero regains hearts. The dungeon master will have to rectify these as soon as they're able to. Now after we have played the hero actions we're then going to refill our hand up to our hand limit. At this point as well if you did want to discard a card you can always put it on the bottom of your deck because maybe it'll be useful for you to have that card at a later turn, and then you can draw up to your hand limit. So now we're ready to move the hero. This is pretty simple. You're just going to move your hero until it runs in to its first obstacle, which for my dungeon is an orc. Now my orcs are leveled up to 10 strength. So on my turn of defending my dungeon, I'll simply roll two die, and I can see here, I have an eight and a nine plus my 10 strength. I definitely will have caused damage because altogether I am over 20 points. So I will give two damage to this hero. Damage to the hero is tracked down here at the bottom. You can see all these hearts. So go ahead and color in 
two hearts for the damage the hero received in this attack. If you have hero actions up here, we have to address these. So it says, in the next fight, the monster has negative three strength. That's okay, because I would still be over 20. So I can discard this one from the game, because I have fulfilled it. And then this one says, at the start of the next turn, the hero regains two hearts. So I'm probably going to have to apply this to my next turn and go ahead and give those hearts back that the orc just took away. Now, what if I wouldn't have rolled such a high value and I was actually below the 20 mark? In that case, you simply cross off your monster. That means that they have fled. So if I had put a treasure with this monster, that treasure would no longer count because the monster has fled and the treasure is no longer being guarded. Traps are also crossed off immediately. It can only be set off one time. If a hero were to ever cross over a trap again that has already been crossed off, it would not affect them. The same goes for monsters. If a hero crosses through a monster that's already fled, they would not need to battle that monster again. On the other hand, if the monster monster is still in that space and not crossed off, then the hero will need to battle and encounter that monster again. So after all players have finished step two, which is carry out an encounter and play dungeon actions, which remember, dungeon actions are your blue cards, then we move on to hero action cards. We're now able to play hero action cards on our opponents. And lastly, we'll refill our hand and then start from step one again, which is move our hero. We've looked at some of the red cards, but let's take a quick look at some of the blue cards that help defend our dungeon. Some of these are going to allow you to roll more than two dice, while others are simply going to help increase your strength during battle. These are very useful cards to have during the end phase of the game where you're defending the dungeon. So keep in mind, when you're drafting cards during that phase phase one and you're building your dungeon, you may want to keep these top portions of the card in mind as well. So phase three, defending your dungeon, will continue just like this until heroes have exited the dungeon. Now different dungeons may complete their battles at different times. If your hero exits your dungeon before other players, you can still continue playing hero actions on your opponents until their hero has reached the exit. So let's go over final scoring. Once all heroes have reached the exit of all the dungeons, we can then go ahead and figure out our score. First, you're going to want to look for any treasures you wrote down. Make sure that they are still defended by a monster and go ahead and put a check mark if they are. You'll then tally up all your treasures still accounted for and guarded by monsters and multiply it by your treasure points. In this case, all of my treasures would only be worth one point. You're then going to count up any goblins you still have in your your dungeon that have not fled, okay? And these are ones that we didn't put an X over. You're gonna do the same for orcs and dragons. Now remember, goblins are worth one, orcs are worth two, and dragons are worth three. You're then gonna get five bonus points if you were able to cross off all of your hero's hearts. If you are not able to kill your hero, then you will receive minus one for each heart left after your hero exited the dungeon. Go ahead and tally your score up here. The player with the most points wins. Well, thank you so much for joining me at the table as I walked you through how to play Doodle Dungeons. This is a game our family has absolutely loved playing. We love the different phases of gameplay here where in the beginning you get to draw your dungeon, then you get to take on the role of hero and and you know, try to navigate through an opponent's dungeon. And then finally, you are defending your dungeon. There is so much gameplay in Doodle Dungeon, and the artwork is actually done by the same person who brought us Munchkin, if you're familiar with that game. So it's definitely iconic and recognizable. Well, we have had the opportunity to play this at two, three, and four player. I will say two player is probably my favorite just because it really, the momentum of the game is a little bit quicker. At four player, player, of course, it's really fun because a lot of these hero action cards are getting put out and there's a lot more going on uh, against dungeon masters. There's a great interaction in this game, even though you do feel isolated from time to time, like when you're drawing your dungeon, you're kind of on your own, uh, you know, knowing that someone else is going to be the hero in your dungeon, that's some great interaction. And then of course, you know, being able to play those uh, hero actions on opponents is really fun at the end of the game. But yes, with a four player count, it does take some time to get through that last portion of the game. Uh, at least the way we play, I think once people 
are really familiar with the mechanics, you could probably try to play that simultaneously, although there are certain times where you need all of the dice for your turn. So it doesn't really work very well to do that, and the phases can get a little confusing if you try to do things at the same time. I wish that this game was easier to teach because I know so many people that would love this game that aren't technically like gamers, but I feel like because of the three phases, it can feel really overwhelming. Also, when you're drawing your dungeon uh, and it's literally just a blank space that can feel really paralyzing to people as well because they're not sure how to have the foresight of where to put things until they've played the game a couple times and can maybe develop more of a strategy on how to build their dungeon. The replayability of this game is absolutely fabulous because you can always try different strategies. You can level up different monsters. You could try to just level up traps. It also kind of depends on what comes out in that drafting pool when you are drafting your dungeon cards. You may not get what you want and you have to just build your dungeon based on what is available. We have really enjoyed this game. Um, of course, we've played it with our two older kids. Um, my eight and six year old are definitely uh, wanting to play this game, but it is just a little bit too meaty for them. But we have really enjoyed playing it with our junior hires. And of course, Josh and I really love it too. I would love to uh, take my time and honestly do this with colored pencils because these dungeons just turn out so cool and so far I've kept like all of our dungeons and they're really fun to look back at and just see what we've created. I've also found that having a few of these in the box really helps too because when we teach new people we can kind of pull them out and give them some visual examples aside from what you can find in the rule book of course. So. And if I didn't mention already, I love that these are double-sided. I, I always hate roll and writes where the back is just blank and it's like, what am I gonna do with this? Why did you give me a blank back? Like, why not double-side these babies? We can get some more use out of them. <laughs> I also really love the idea the designers did of hiding treasure in your dungeon and then like keeping that on your score sheet. It reminded me a little bit of Battleship um, because when the heroes are going through your dungeon, you know, you can see, okay, like for instance, this one, you can see that they had eight treasure. So you're like, okay, I've got to try to figure out where I think they would have hid this treasure so that possibly, uh, you know, the monster won't be able to defend itself and they'll flee and then my opponent will lose their treasure. So I really like that as well. And of course, you know, they've got some really fun thematic things like you can name your dungeon and give yourself a dungeon master name. Super cute, great artwork, great components. The cards are amazing quality and uh, we just really enjoy this game. So it was a pleasure to get to share it with you guys. And hopefully if you haven't given this a try or it's been on your wish list, this video kind of helped you understand understand a little bit more of how the game works and plays. It is a little bit more of a complex roll and write. Also, it's not one you can really do solo because you need somebody to actually be that hero. You can't really do that part on your own. You can't make your own hero path because obviously you kind of know which direction you want your hero to go. Um, so that that is kind of a bummer because I think this would be such a fun solo game, but there's just really no way to solo it with that, you know, draw the hero path um, element of the game. Well, as always, thank you guys so much for watching this video. I always appreciate it. If you can give me a thumbs up and subscribe, that really helps our channel grow. And I'll see you later. Life is a winding road. No telling where it goes.